We, we will start over here with, who's up first? You are, yes, with Rolf. Well done. Well, so go ahead, Rolf. This is Rolf Erdman from PT Scientist. Yes. Hello, everybody. So amazingly, over the last two days, we had a lot of international participants, many different accents. And um, those who don't know me, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm from Kansas. <laughs> Actually, I am. So, um, so as far as landing site selection, so my, my American and, and German parents, so they kept alternating between East Kansas and the far east of Kansas, a place called Germany, where I work again now. So uh, PT Sciences headquartered in Berlin. And we also talked a, lo a lot about uh, lunar landing site selection. So uh, what you see here is the Apollo 17 landing site. I'll cut it short. That's where we're going. It's not up for debate. And it, it was also a very long decision. A lot of uh, information went into it before we actually could decide for it. Um, but I do want to take you from this picture taken in 1972 to a vision in the future, in the not too distant future. So um, we heard earlier in the Isaac G, so there are many precursor missions towards uh, a future human presence. And uh, we are a commercial space company, so we have many partners, commercial partners, so non-traditional uh, space company partners, and one of them, this is their vision. Do I need to point it at something or? Point it over there to Ricky Guest. That's the big, big one. Mission control command. Departing for expedition. Over. Mission goal. All data looks beautiful. Channel's clear. Over. Armstrong. 1969. Apollo 17. 1972. <laughs> there you go. All right. So back to lunar landing site selection. Yeah, a very difficult process. I don't want to be in some people's shoes. We are beyond that. Um, but uh, it never gets easy, right? There's nothing easy about uh, landing on the moon. So um, uh, our advice to you, um, don't just pick one. Just go to all of them because we are lunar. Uh, um, transportation service provider. So we um, uh, will provide the lunar surface mobility as we will provide the, uh, the lunar landing vehicle. Uh, Carsten gave you a lightning talk earlier. So he said, this rover you see right here is uh, one of the most, or the most aesthetically pleasing in the universe. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is the vision. This would be a culmination of our mission is actually to, um, to uh, go to the LRV vehicle, which is still sitting there. So uh, we definitely, I know a lot about keep out zones. We will treat this like entering a church and do all the right things. But uh, this, is, this is the vision. So um, the gentleman who um, announced this rover, it's called the Audi Luna Quattro, was no less than the late Gene Cernan. So uh, we are very happy to have had him on our team. So this is at the Detroit Auto Show in January 2016. And, and we, we actually learned a lot and, and, and uh, uh, discussed a lot of awesome things already with Gene. Here's that other machine we're building. Uh, it's called ALINA, standing for Autonomous uh, Landing and Navigation Module. So um, we have picked our blessings in what we're trying to accomplish as well as our poisons. And one of them is the precision landing, which we deem as very important for future lunar landers. So um, that is part of what we're trying to do. Uh, we are also team builders, um, so it's very important you get the right team members. Uh, um, you may recognize a few faces here, so we're working very closely with ESA. We're working very closely, closely with uh, um, a lot of folks who work in the European Space Operations Center, um, uh, flight dynamics officers, and um, 
I'll keep it at that. It gets too complicated. I do want to mention we have a guy in the room here, uh, um, Hank Rogers, uh, uh, who brought Tetris to the world. And, and, and in a way, I feel the same way when I'm building my team, like playing Tetris on a, on a, a, a basically space scale. You really have to make the right decisions and, and bring the right pieces to the puzzle. And we have all the pieces to the puzzle. So um, another big um, of our partners, and, and they're not sponsors, it's very important to point out, these are partners, uh, is Vodafone. So Vodafone, uh, uh, like Audi, is a, is a provider, not just of funds, but the technologies. And um, as was Jack was mentioning, if you bring a rover to the moon, you, you need to bring a jack, right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, so um, uh, we, we have one scientific payload, uh, which I do want to mention, we have many payloads, and these people want to announce on their own terms. So um, I, I'm just, I'm uh, uh, basically pointing you towards Kieran Carroll, who's back there. He did a talk, he, he has a poster, so go see him. Um, and, and here you see Harrison with the gravimeter experiment on the moon. And in the rationale which uh, uh, um, Harrison gave us, um, so we have two rovers on the moon, so we need two jacks. <laughs> Here's another one to the, uh, the bottom left. That is Jack Crenshaw. He's an Apollo flight dynamics officer. So we work with a lot of uh, seasoned people who, um, uh, who have done very similar things. I mean, it's not exact. We, we're using very modern technologies, everything. So this is my last slide. And uh, I would like to basically point out, so people are asking, why is commercial space going to be successful. And just like landing sites, if you pick your top five, it's a very difficult decision to come up with the points. I could give you 50 slides, 50 reasons. These are my top slides. And I do want to remind how important dissimilar redundancy is in the program. So if you have operational experience, I worked as a flight controller at the Johnson Space Center. Remember, I'm from Kansas, right? So, But I worked at JC in Houston for uh, uh, many years. So I did 19 space shuttle miss missions. 30 ISS expeditions, 100 spacewalks. And with that knowledge, I mean, these are my top reasons. I would say it is very important commercial space uh, gets into the game because elsewise uh, a return to the moon is going to be very, very difficult. That's it. Thank, so, you. thank you very much. And I'm from northern Indiana. <laughs> so, all right, Aditya, Team Indus. Uh, good evening. So uh, just an introduction. So I, I work as the mission systems engineer for Lander Systems at Team Indus. Uh, and our journey basically started with uh, participating in the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Uh, what, what, what we have are uh, lunar landing and lunar surface exploration technologies that we've built as part of participating in the competition. Uh, two of the key things for, for the lander itself, the first one is landing mechanisms. Uh, and the other one is Lunar Descent GNC. So that, that's, that's basically built uh, from the ground up in, in India. Uh, and th th there are certain precisions and there are certain capabilities that, that we're adding on top of it. Our first mission is, is, gonna, uh, is gonna demonstrate uh, precision of, of 100 meters for landing, uh, including safe spot detection and hazard avoidance. Uh, and, and the landing mechanism itself has, has certain capabilities which which are built into the current version of the lander. Uh, the thermal descent with uh, safe spot detection, this, this is a, a small demo of that, if it works. Okay. Oh. okay. All right. It's okay. Uh, so ba basically, what what it, what it shows is uh, th this is this is the the, the scene seen by the lander uh, at a particular altitude. It picks a safe spot that that's as close as possible to it, so that it doesn't have to waste too much propellant in diverting. And then it successfully gets gets as close to the center of that box, which it identifies identified in the beginning as a safe spot. So uh, that that's a demo of 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 the technology that we're building. Uh, this is this is the the lander itself. Uh, the, there are very various tests that we that we completed. Uh, a lot of them on full scale on on scaled scaled down landers, 
uh, as well as our test, uh, uh, as in just, just take a single leg, drop it, check the mechanism, try it again and again, and make it more mass efficient and perform better. Uh, the, these are uh, key specs of, of the lander itself. Uh, I'd like to call attention to, to the partners that we have, uh, starting with the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, Kines, the French National Space Agency, is giving uh, as, as, as a camera that, that's going to that's going to fly on Mars 2020. Uh, CEO Boulder, especially LASP, who's, who's helping us with the mission operation software. Uh, and Team Hakuto, uh, uh, that's, that's the iSpace rover that's going to the moon. Uh, this, this is the, the micro rover that, that we're building, which, which uh, has, has certain uh, uh, unique features, especially being, being in the micro rover cate category. Uh, th these are the first such small rovers that will go to the go to the lunar surface, the other one, of course, being the iSpace rovers. Uh, that, that's the rover itself, and contrasting with PT scientists' design, it's, it's not exactly aesthetically pleasing, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, 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 it, but it does its job. Uh, these, these are some of the more uh, development and uh, uh, performance uh, evaluation tests that, that we did at, at Team Indus facilities. Okay, we're not we're not going to find definitely shaped uh, rocks there, but but that's a that's a good way of stressing the system. Uh, uh, as as part of our landing site analysis and and again to to educate operational decision making, we we did a lot of work on uh, on terrain data, and one one of the key things is is reachability analysis. So uh, a key part of the competition requirement is 500 meters. So we had to analyze a sample terrain and find if we were to land at any given coordinate. Can we do 500 meters without lo losing line of sight? And this is, this I think is a key question for for some of the other follow-up missions as well, that might happen happen to be in uh, in a place where either you don't have uh, com access directly to the Earth, uh, and because of that you're constraining a traverse, or you don't have com access to a surface relay point, which again uh, constrains the the path planning. Uh, that that's a little bit on on the simulation campaigns and uh, an operational readiness test that we're doing with the rover operations team. Uh, these are a few of the payloads and experiments that we're carrying on on the lander. Uh, so the the first line is basically uh, science experiments that that science uh, payloads that that are being carried and developed by by key people who who have done this before. Uh, the second line and the third line, so ba basically these, these two lines are, are student-driven experiments, which, which came off a competition that we hosted in early last year. Uh, and, and, it, and it covers basically the green ones. They cover uh, mostly uh, biological experiments, so cyanobacteria for radiation shielding, uh, using extremophile uh, bacteria. Uh, and then uh, I, I think we, we have one uh, up there as well, so which is... Uh, trying to, to test the regenerative properties of flatworms. Uh, the last one, uh, the last line, what we have is uh, electrostatic deflection of char charged particles, so using uh, an electrostatic field as a radiation shield. Uh, then uh, a, a miniature uh, lunar hub, so try to sustain uh, Earth-like atmosphere, so one atmosphere within a tiny, tiny dome for one complete lunar day and see the, uh, the profile of uh, pressure loss. Uh, there's another one which, which tries to study lunar dust, uh, and uh, we, we'd, we'd like the community, the lunar science community, to look at some of our experiments, one from a science, pure science review and science quality return perspective, and the other one is to see if any of your, your work can integrate with this or, or the other way around. Uh, so so in, in terms of landing site analysis, and this purely comes from uh, the first tech demonstration, uh, what, what we considered were, were three major uh, places, especially where, where the NAC DTMs are available. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a point for concern as well, and, I, and I'd like to raise that, which is there are certain uh, new places that are being, uh, uh, new regions that are being proposed for, for landing and probably for rover missions. And we, we, are, we are losing time on, on, on the LROC. So there are some places where we don't have uh, stereo repeat uh, ground traces. We might want to collect them sooner, sooner than later, in case there are there are places of interest. Uh, so that's our, our landing site and a close-up of that. So the closest two features are 
uh, Mons Lahir and uh, the Anagrid crater. So that, that's, the, that's the place that we've picked. Uh, that's our timeline, and we are, we are hoping to get this uh, mission to the moon uh, this year and, and follow that up with, with future launches. So what, what we're looking for is to, to firm up the system requirements by the end of this year uh, for the follow-up mission. So, thank you. Mastin is up next with Shul Mahoney. Thanks everyone for sticking around for a little bit of overtime. Um, I'm gonna try, as, as I talk a little bit about what Mastin is doing, to not wind up repeating, it, this is, our aspirations are large, but the community is very small. And I love the fact that as things have gone on, we've started to kind of adopt some of the different ideas of some of the other providers, and you start to see some, some convergence. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what Mastin is doing. Um, I, I did realize, though, for this particular presentation, it is extremely important to follow the conventions of the conference and make sure I give Dr. Neal credit for this presentation as well, because I saw his name on every other presentation, so I thought I'd put him on there. Um, so the, the, the three takeaways. Number one, see me or my colleague, uh, Matt Coons, who's our uh, chief engineer. If he has not already cornered you with his uh, notebook. Um, he, we are here today to make sure we're doing the outreach to this community. You are the people who are really going to the moon. Uh, and so we wanna make sure we get, there's Matt now. Matt, wave, there you go. Um, wanna make sure we get a chance to talk to you and understand what it is you're uh, looking to do uh, on the moon. Number two, these are the two design points that we have as the references for taking payloads to the surface of the moon. 100 kilograms now, 1.5 metric tons at some point in the future. We'll talk a little bit more about those two design points. Uh, and the third thing is just to, to understand there's a lot of different approaches to being able to provide this commercial service. And if you're not familiar, I've been a little bit surprised that some folks say, well, who is Mastin? What are you guys doing? Um, we've been a little bit quiet, but we've been at this for almost 14 years. We won the NASA Centennial Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge X Prize. I think I got all of the correct people in there. In 2009, and I will tell you, as you well know, in 2009, there weren't that many missions going to the moon. This is now when missions are gonna be going to the moon. So we've been working hard in maturing our technology, and not only maturing our technology, but maturing our approach to this, to this emerging industry. I want to take a few minutes here to tell you a couple things that are the core of what we, Mastin has done and why that might be different. The other thing that I want to help you think about is that this is not just cheaper. If we're talking about changing the way we access space and a commercial approach, it's not just me and just the other providers up here. It's going to be you Two. And after years and years and years and years of being in conference rooms and not being able to get stuff done, the switch is going to flip and it's not going to be another 10 years before the next mission. It might not even be next 10 months. And so I'm hoping that you can see what some of us have been doing on the provider, the transportation side, and start thinking about how you will approach lunar science not the first one, but the second, third, fourth. The first thing that I'll tell you what Mastin has done is a, instead of a mission-driven approach, a capability-driven approach. We basically took a lander design, and any time it started to get too expensive, we said, we'll take the cheaper option. Part of providing a cheaper access to the surface is there's some things you're not going to get. So I have a collection of low points in the cost curve that allows me to come up with a very efficient lander that's pretty much no frills. The second thing is that reuse changes the development approach. It will also change the science on the surface. When everything gets thrown away, it costs more. Got it. But it's more than just that. When you have a vehicle you have a transportation system that is reusable, that is recoverable. You don't have to have eight or nine nines lined up. You can fly a thing 
see if it works, land it, and fly it again. Now, I would suggest before going to the moon, you do some testing on, on the Earth, and that's where we can increase the number of times we get a chance to get data, to get experience. Um, one of the things I will advocate for is take advantage of Flight Opportunities Program. They had the corner booth set up. Uh, a couple of their folks are in the back, Alex, Steve. Uh, talk to them. Don't wait for your first launch to the moon for the first time your team's doing a payload integration. Go get experience, take the technology out, make sure that it works. That's one of the things we've seen that has been useful for us and useful for others as well. Mastin has been flying multiple vehicles over these multiple years. These are not PowerPoint slides. I mean, okay, this is a PowerPoint slide. These are actual vehicles <laughs> that actually fly. And I will tell you, landing is hard. Even after we thought we had it licked, turns out it's still hard. In order to develop a robust system that will be able to transport your science, we have been working to expand the capabilities across a lot of different conditions here in Mojave, down the road, but here on Earth, and start maturing that technology so you don't have to hope that it works, you know that it works. Okay, so great, I wanna to go to the moon, how are you gonna get me there? XL1, this is, uh, we're one of the catalyst partners working with NASA to develop a lander that is going to be able to take a reasonable payload at a reasonable price. Um, we've got, honestly, the technology that's behind it is probably less interesting. What's more interesting is that you're going to get your science there. Um, this is uh, past PDR. We are, already have the terrestrial test bed. Uh, in construction, so if you want to test an analog uh, of your science payload before it goes to the moon, we will have a terrestrial test bed uh, to test that out on. And then as we get to the future, uh, you may have heard a reference to Zeus. The idea here is take a mast and propulsion system and strap it onto an upper stage. Pictured here is uh, ULA's ACES upper stage. It allows you to then set that upper stage down in a horizontal orientation, vertical landing. Get your payload close to the surface and that will allow us to do a lot more. And hopefully as your science starts getting feedback, we start feeding that into where are the places we need to go, where is the manufacturing, where are the fuel plants, all the rest of it. Um, Zeus is going to be an important piece uh, of that architecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to your questions and we'll be here throughout. Our last presentation, Michael Sims from Series Robotics. Thanks. Uh, I have no slides, so that should help us move along, hopefully. <laughs> um, I, I love being in this session. Uh, I love being here in general because I think we're doing space differently. Commercial activities now have an impact on that. At Series Robotics, we're in the business of building robots. We're a new company, a fresh commercial company, in the business of building robots and manipulators, mobility and manipulation for planetary surfaces, moon, Mars, asteroids. We're gonna ride with one of these guys or one of the other payload landed people. And if you look at new space, most, most of what new space companies are focused on is launching and landing, right? And there's been a huge amount of work in launching from, uh, we heard from Blue Moon, but from a lot of players, right? And in terms of landing, several of these guys, and several have been here before, were in the Google Lunar X Prize. And uh, I'll make a prediction, um, and I hope I'm wrong, but unfortunately, I don't know of any of them that are integrating yet, so I suspect, unless they extend a timeline again, no one's gonna make win this time. That's not these guys, and it's not NASA's fault. Um, that came actually from the way the constraints were built in terms of restricting the, the partnership, the government-private partnership. I, my background is from NASA, NASA Robotics Missions, uh, Moon Express, and that corresponds to the background for most people on my team. It's almost the same. So um, so I, I want to say a little bit more about... so. 
I always like to come from the from the end point and then come back to what we're trying to do right now. And most of what I have heard conversations today, not all, but most, I would categorize as here's what I want to do, and I want to sprinkle some commercial activities on top of that because that might make it cheaper by a third or it might make it a little f more frequent. But if you if we go to an endpoint, if we look at the last major transition in planetary research, it occurred in the, you know, 50 years ago, and it occurred because of humans going to the moon, right? That was a major push for us having planetary vehicles going. Well, I would argue that we're going back to the space, moon and Mars, shortly. That's going to be, have a major impact. And so let me just give you a couple of places where you can look at that. There are a lot of ways you could fly, um, and a lot of companies that will send you there. AC from uh, Blue Moon indicated that the vision of the company was a million people living and working in space, right? And that's sort of where we come from, too. That's kind of our vision of what's going on. Um, if you think of SpaceX, they have this rocket called a B, what's it called, BFR, right? The BFR, um, if one of those landed, if you believe it, which you may or may not, but if you believe it, one of those landing on the moon will allow you to land mass-wise more than 100 Curiosity rovers. So suddenly you're not in a realm of, oh, I put one here, one there. You can send, you know, a dozen rovers to um, um, SPA. You, there are a lot of options available to you that actually come to almost directly out of that. Um, but the bottom line is we can't afford it. We can't afford those rovers. We can't afford to do that system. And that's not how I'm suggesting we spend it, but it gives you some indication of what you can actually do with these guys. So we're in the business of um, making the robot tools that you will use on these missions and integrating those into the landed missions um, to make possible human expansion and the huge amount of science that's going to come as a consequence of that. So that's you. Okay, we have time for some questions of this august panel. Um, questions, not monologues, please. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, yeah. um, so I asked this at a different conference, but basically like the expansion west, we offered people 40 acres and a mule, or like for the expansion to the new world, it was mainly prisoners. So how are you guys going to sort of expand or inspire the next generation to go to the moon? I think um, if you look at development, it's like gentrification occurs where the artists are. So is there any, I mean, I liked your commercial, but uh, going beyond that, what is it? I go with prisoners, but I'm popping <laughs> off to somebody else. So Ralph, you want to, anybody want to take that? Um, so uh, I, I think you, you asked this question on the panel yesterday as well for uh, the, the commercial guys. So uh, w w one of the things was to involve, and I, and I put that on one slide, which was the lap to moon competition that was to involve students into science and that, that sort of brought them into this sort of community. So probably they did not, did not know too much about it, but they now know that there is a lunar science community and there is a scope for, sco scope for interacting with them. And, and, and again, that, that community can only grow. So if there are five people on, on one team developing an experiment, there's going to be their friends who will know about that. The space roughnecks will have no problem. It was the, when the first job posting is up for someone to go work the moon, we have plenty of people, probably a few people, probably even this room. Uh, the, I think the important part is making sure that there is um, enough resources and tools available when the people get there. And that's where the robotic precursors and the scientific precursors are going to start answering the questions of where to go? Where do you not step off the boat and wind up in a swamp? So when, when that actually happens, imagine you offer a slot going to the moon. You, one, one person can go to the moon. You're going to have thousands of people, 10,000s of people who want to get on that, on that uh, trip and, and for a diversity of reasons. So uh, really, truly, initially, I didn't even understand the question because I think that's a given that we will not have uh, a lack of volunteers there. And, 
The question is, on the first missions, how do we make it work? Uh, um, that that is, a, is a big question, of course. And there's going to be uh, um, huge selection boards, I mean, picking these people again. And ultimately, these selections, they're going to get much, much smaller. And it's individuals, I mean, paying their right, just like on on ISS. I mean, we, we had the space tourists, and that's going to continue as well. So it's, it's all going to fall into place. No, I think the other thing is you've got to develop capabilities and you start small and build up. Um, we have four, four people here for representing different companies that would do that. So I'm, I'm going to start with Rolf and I'm going to ask each one of you to say, when are you going to, when are you going to launch to the moon? When are you going to land on the surface? Yeah. And, 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 when are you going to start bringing stuff back from the moon? Oh, yeah. Okay, regarding your first question, that is such an excellent question. I, I do not want to spoil it with an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we should have brought the beer in here. Real <laughs> answer, so, yeah, no, the, the answer is, I will give you an answer. It's no earlier than 2019. Okay. So, and uh, regarding the second question, sample return, uh, um, of course, we are going through all kinds of architecture steps. I told you initially, uh, we looked at at all the scenarios and you have to basically always settle for compromise. That doesn't change. Right. So our compromise is not doing a sample return mission on these first robotics missions. I mean, things can no. change any time. Uh, understood. But understood. Uh, that is not our approach. Okay. Aditya. Same nice question, but uh, uh, we, we have a lander that, that's, that's integrated. Uh, we have a rover that, that we're doing uh, last minute tests to in order to qualify that, that for integration. but. Uh, again, uh, it, it's similar to what, what you mentioned, that uh, th there are certain uh, uh, financial environments in, in which you, you can't really go from a complete payload to, to launch very quickly. Uh, we're, we're hoping that that scenario changes. So when that changes, we, we, we can launch immediately. But uh, we, we hope to complete this by, by the end of this year. Uh, and in terms of sample return, uh, we, we're still in initial studies regarding the technologies required for that. Uh, but we thought uh, the priorities would be to make our system more precise. So in case we, we, can, we can nail a landing, we, we want to do it more precisely and do that again. Uh, but again, sample return certainly seems to be uh, something for science that, that's good, and that's also for uh, ISRU test, right. as in you have good enough resources good. for that. Sure. Commercial doesn't mean charity. So we, you know, when the check clears is the simple answer for, for both of those. Um, we have generally tried to stay away from saying what we're going to do and just say what it is we've done. I've learned that in this industry. Having said that, I will tell you that my prediction, this is not, I'm not promising, prediction is uh, you'll see a Mastin uh, first mission to the moon probably 2021. Okay. Can happen sooner. Yep. It's dependent on you. And sample return, I mean, we've already demonstrated the core technology for a gas and go system. Um, it's really just a question of you know, who, who lines up where, you know. Uh, we're transportation. Yeah. So if you got the capsule all set, we'll bring it back, not a problem. Right. And Michael, I presume that when these guys go, you'll be ready. Yeah. So yeah. Our, our expectation right now is that we will be ready to go in 2019. Okay. So, um, but another comment on, on the question about sample return. Sample return is going to occur at some point along the way. We're going to do sample return. But if you believe the other part of the story about human commercialization, human traveling, you're going to be able to put a metric ton lab on the surface of the moon or Mars relatively soon, five, ten years, certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just think of taking, bottling up your lab and putting a metric ton of that. Yeah, I've tried bottling up my lab and moving it down the <laughs> corridor and it buggers everything up. So yeah, It might well do that, yeah, too. So I'll build you a new one. Uh, Renee. So a different kind of sample return from the lunar surface is not only physical samples, but also just the housekeeping or metadata that whatever you send down to the surface will return, uh, health and status checks, that kind of thing. And that information is hopefully independent of whatever your payload is. Some of that may end up actually being scientifically useful, and I'm curious if you have thought or planned out what that data will be. Uh, so you're, you're referring to systems data, right? Not pay, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's a big piece of the architecture. <coughs> so uh, uh, it all has to do with how we basically interact in our particular case with the ESA's deep space network, so the SREC system. So um, uh, 
it's all about modems, certain things, which ground stations are available. So uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of thought going in there, and we're already looking ahead. As Carsten mentioned earlier, we have a, um, a commercial partner in, in communications, so um, uh, Vodafone also is looking ahead. Um, they want to get really involved in this, so um, there are many different ways you can do that with many different technologies, different data rates. It's, it's a super interesting market. Um, I, I don't know whether we can liken it to the beginning of the uh, satellite business in, in, in communications, navigation satellite business in low Earth orbit, in, in, in other orbits, uh, uh, circling the Earth, but something's going on here for sure. Mm -hmm. So, and when we send data back from a rover, for example, um, a certain portion of that via NASA regulations and protocol is immediately available, and some of it becomes available over time. Some of it's never made available, right? There are ITAR restrictions, there, and there are also a suite of proprietary restrictions. People want to keep their hands around it so somebody else doesn't know exactly what they're doing. I suspect that will keep going, but if there are particular pieces of data that are really important, that can always, I think, be accessed. Uh, I, I think uh, there's, there's, there's an initiative from both sides, uh, and, and, I, uh, and I heard uh, from Karsten in the, uh, in the previous session, which is uh, they, they're using uh, real data for, uh, for someone to learn more about lunar soil. So uh, I, I think uh, if, if it's, uh, if it, so, so, so you have a lot of engineering data that goes along with science data on, and, and that's presented in, in a certain manner, but it takes time. Uh, uh, I think if, if there's more interest from scientists that are looking for certain things from, say, a rover or a lander, uh, it, it can come up as, as, as a proposal from them as well. Yeah. Uh, we, we would like to make that open. Uh, of course, we do not have the ITAR restrictions, but of course, if we use the DSN, then there is a little bit of, of, of restrictions on navigation data probably. But once you're on the surface or there's any other data product that's being generated on our lander, uh, that, that's available for discussion, and, and we'd like to promote that. Okay. All right, last question, because the beverages are waiting. Yes. All right. Uh, so currently, it seems like there's a lot of companies kind of throwing their hat in the ring uh, to kind of be the one to enable our commercial space operations. So five, ten years down the road, do you guys see kind of one or two companies kind of having a controlling share? Uh, in commercial space operations, or is there going to be more of a kind of distributed presence? Uh, and I guess what are the implications for like innovation uh, and reliability? So I'll I'll jump on this one. Um, there are yes, there are a lot of companies, um, and it's great to see um, you know people innovating, standing on the shoulders of giants like Mastin certainly has. Um, yeah, there probably will be some consolidation. If you look at our sister side on the launch, there's a lot of launch companies right now. Um, depending upon who and where you count it, there's like 70 some small launch companies. They are not all gonna survive. Um, and so, yes, there will be some consolidation. There will be, uh, in a capitalist society, creative destruction. Um, what I would anticipate will happen is that there will be some um, consolidation, however, the um, the community, the government, uh, not to speak for the government, um, but there is interest in uh, the boring term vendor diversity. And so it has explicitly been one of the objectives in this round that we don't wind up with just a single provider because what will happen is the same thing that has happened in the previous iteration. The prices will go up because if you have a single provider, that's what happens. <coughs> so um, the, the short answer is, yeah, not everyone's going to survive. But I will point out, pieces go on. And, and the people will still be in this community, and they'll, they'll come back together. So um, just because a company fails doesn't mean that the technology will be lost. So one, one additional comment is um, it's easy to view all of this as zero sum, and I think that's really the wrong way to view it. Mm -hmm. All of this is creating markets which weren't there before. Uh, NASA did a really powerful job with the COTS program. You know, they opened up um, for commercial, a new set of commercial launch vehicles. But that didn't destroy uh, Lockheed and didn't destroy Boeing. So it actually gave more competition, which was better overall. And I suspect that that's what we will see in the future. Apart from the fact of competition, which is very important, right? We're commercial. 
dissimilar redundancy. I mean, if you try to operate any base, look at the ISS. Okay, uh, hopefully nobody in of these companies or the ones we saw yesterday will ever have a failure, right? Let's let's hope for it. But <laughs> if it doesn't happen, and if it happens in sequence, like we have seen, look at look at uh, the International Space Station. Uh, you basically you lose that station if you don't have very different ways of doing the same thing. Again, dissimilar redundancy. You have to have that. So there have to be several companies out there doing the same thing, and they have to successfully do it. As you said, how this all falls into place, we will see. But uh, I mean, it's it's unperceivable that you have just one aircraft company on this globe. That you just have one automaker on this globe. The same thing runs true for the moon. There's no doubt about it. So. I think that there's another way to, to look at this, which is uh, uh, any, any example you pick up, as in technology has diversity both in the same country as well as outside. So uh, if, if you have, have governments having strategic interests in certain technologies, uh, you will have diversity anyway. Uh, you, you can see that that, that that diversity sort of has resulted in uh, probably a greater frequency of Chinese missions to the moon. Uh, and that diversity will remain, but but in order to harness that, you need probably science going on different missions, on different countries' uh, missions. So uh, that 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 probably will will prevent that that sort of uh, monopolization of the access to the moon. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, very much. I I do want to point out that this panel come shows the diversity in the commercial sector because this wasn't planned. This is, this, we, we, we've actually bowed to peer pressure. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're all sheep. But, but it's good to get out there. And I, and I think what we've got to watch out for is that this, this, this new capability, and I use that term very generally, is going to evolve. And, you know, that, that evolution is going to be interesting to watch, but we need to be part of that evolution uh, from the, the science and exploration communities to be able to be to, to, to actually st help steer that evolution. Um, and I want to thank our, our panelists here. I want to thank Rolf and Aditya and Sean and Michael. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Greg now. What are we doing, Greg?